so thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I sort of feel that uh, uh, somebody referred to, I think it was uh, Elizabeth this morning, we were being the last person between the audience and lunch. I'm the last person between you and, and freedom. And, uh, though it sounds like you all just want to stick around and keep on hacking stuff. I think I heard a couple of people and that's going to go off and try something and so on. Um, so I'm going to take you back in time. And I want to remind you of a newsletter called Computing in the Classics and a sort of aspirational supplement from the 1989 version written by Bernie Fisher, in which he announced the UCLA Classicist Workbench. And this workbench, uh, I'm just going to read a little bit here, the goal of the UCLA Classicist Workbench is to create a distributed computing network for the study of classics at all levels, including the beginning student and the most advanced scholar, a generic tool or kit of tools for accomplishing the major tasks of assembling, learning, researching, and communicating the information proper to a discipline. If you go on and read, there was a number of uh, components there in, in this sort of vision that he had back then. One was that he would support the entire, what I'm going to call the entire scholarly cycle from the, the learning and the pedagogy right to the communication of uh, research results. Integration was a big part of this that he was going to bring together in one place all the different data, the morphological analyzers, uh, the, uh, all the parsers, encyclopedias, text, dictionaries, images. He talked about video discs. Remember video discs? <laughs> you know, that's how we did multimedia for a while there. <clears throat> uh, it was going to be a network system. It was going to, the networking was provided. The server was going to be a VAX 11750 with two Fujitsu Evo 470 megabyte uh, <laughs> hard drives. He had decided not, this was a strategic decision not to use CD-ROM, uh, and then it was networked to 15 Macintoshes, and you could actually dial in from home with a computer. Um, it was, as I mentioned, for the beginning student to the advanced scholar, it was open-ended. I found this very interesting in the sense he deliberately said this will never be finished, and lo and behold, it, I, I don't believe it has been finished. <laughs> And finally, it was going to improve the accuracy and speed with which they can read Greek and obtain background information, and also Latin was going to be added later on. It sounds a lot like what we heard at the beginning of this conference from Greg Crane. I, I wrote down <laughs> actually credits Greg Crane and the, the, what was then called the Harvard Computing Project or something like that, Computing Classics Project. It hadn't yet become uh, Perseus or Pandora or anything like that. He credits them with a lot of the ideas and with some of the early technology. But uh, Greg gave us two uh, actually quite, uh, I think, important uh, and ambitious goals. One was to advance the role of Greco-Roman culture. And he elaborated on that, and, and as deeply, and, and you know, including uh, developing a dialogue and, and a global dialogue. And the second one was to blow off the dust, blow the dust off the simple, cogent, and ancient term philology, support an open philology that can, in turn, support a dialogue among civilizations. And he proceeded to list. This where some of you may have gotten a slightly different list, but this is what I got in there. And a lot of these elements showed up in that vision by Bernie Fisher. You know, open. Uh, he added the element of openness, but the idea was you're going to have all the Greek and Latin texts. Um, Fisher talked about open-ended, but he wasn't meaning open in the sense that we now talk about open. Uh, comprehensive uh, data sets. Uh, multi-text, annotations, deep linguistic annotation, and the full workflow. Remember that sort of cycle from beginning to end of the research cycle. So why have I started, why have I started with these uh, two bookends of, of visions? Well, the first reason is, Greg Crane is not here, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I get invited on a regular basis to be the bookend to Greg Crane's introduction. This is not the first time. <laughs> So I thought it was time for me to, to, to you know, do a little multi -test. Actually, we get along great, I'm, I'm not, uh, but I just thought I'd crack that joke. Um, so what I want to do in this talk is first I want to convince you that you are exceptional. I, you know, what better way to, to sort of end the conference is to tell you that you've got a special place in the humanities and in the digital humanities. 
I'm then going to do something, and I'm then going to take a little side tour and talk about the history. I'm, I'm going to give you a very idiosyncratic hop, skip, and a jump through what I consider to be the history of the vision of the ultimate reading machine, which we just heard from 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 uh, you know Frischer and 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 then Crane, and then I'm going to end with a whole mess of platitudes about what you should be doing. You know, since uh, <laughs> since I, I'm a philosopher, I can't I can't leave a talk without giving somebody advice. And my children have left the home, so I have <laughs> So why are you exceptional? And why is there, why is the digital humanities, why does classics have a special place in the digital humanities? Well, partly because you guys have been doing it longer than most other people. Uh, that that uh, newsletter starts in, you know, I think the end of 84. Uh, but there's been all sorts of other various uh, projects. You could say Father Buza's project, even though it was Aquinas, it was Latin. You could say it's a, it is in the spirit of a, it is certainly a philological project. He himself identifies himself as a philologist and talks about why he did this project as a philological project. But there's some other aspects that are interesting about classics. Uh, you guys are uh, truly interdisciplinary in a way that I've been the head, I've been the director, senior director of the Office of Interdisciplinary Studies. So I, I, I've been put through the interdisciplinary mill. And one of the things I get told over and over again is all sorts of departments are interdisciplinary. But very few really are. And classics is one. Classics has always had a mixture of different approaches, perspectives, uh, different media and something like that in a way that I think has made it uh, uh, a perfect test bed, if you will, for the digital humanities uh, at large. And one of the ways you see that is that you have always gone beyond the text. You've always been struggling. Right in Bernie Frischer's first vision in the video desk, we can laugh at it, but right from the beginning of Perseus has been this idea of you can't do classics with text alone. In philosophy, you can. In English literature, you can. And we're very text-based. I didn't quite realize how text-based I was until I went and spent some time in Japan, where even, even text in Japan is, is, not, is not really a, series, a sequence of codes from a restricted alphabet. It's a very calligraphic, almost visual, artistic thing. Their text systems are, are more image databases than, uh, than our idea of, of text as strings, the sort of computing idea of a, of a sequence of characters. But you, in the classics, you have been struggling with trying to do, trying to understand phenomena across multiple media, across different forms, across material and coded forms. You have also, and this is the part that's really cool, because you guys, to some extent, have a controlled playground, you have had the ambition to try to do comprehensive projects in a way that no, very few other disciplines have even tried. I can actually list a series of exceptions to that, but there are very few other areas where you can get most of the important texts and a lot of the other information together in one spot and start doing analysis. In fact, since the 1970s, since the TLG started, you know, it's been possible for at least the, the Greek scholars to try to, you know, <coughs> ask the types of questions that we just heard, that we just heard in the last session being asked. Whereas in English literature, I would say, you know, Ten years ago, it would be very difficult to get together the type of corpus that, that Matt was playing with of uh, 19th century English literature. Uh, the, the other exceptions are interesting. One of them is the TLG. Uh, no, uh, um, en Francais, the TLF. The T's and L seem to be very popular in the 60s and 70s, or the 70s and something like that, which becomes, in North America, it's known as artful. Uh, the French put together for linguistic purposes, not for textual studies or anything. You know, they put together this, the important works in French and something like that, and they build this online network system. It's, a, it's actually very cool. Historically, I, I think, along with the TLG, it's you know, one of the first cases of big data. Uh, but you have big, comprehensive data in the 1970s. And this is, uh, uh, this is a sort of picture of, as I understand it, uh, uh, these are the tapes that you would get when you ordered text from the, the TLG. You, you were telling me how you have some in your office, so I managed to find some pictures of them on, online. Um, you were an early adopter, and I, uh, on the last thing, you have not allowed, I'm not sure it happens, but you have resisted the temptation to separate pedagogy from research. 
uh, you know, it, it is very common, at least in Canadian literature departments, to not give a darn about rhetoric and, you know, we're not teaching writing skills or something like that. I think that's less common in the United States. Uh, in language departments in Canada, there's often, you know, the tutors who don't have tenure, who teach the, the big intro language classes, and then there's the important people who teach the very small classes that nobody wants to take, like <laughs> fourth year, uh, you know, Spanish literature or something like that. And, and we have almost a caste system evolving, and I mean, this is, this is a problem that's getting worse with the whole casual labor problem. But one of the things I'm hearing and I heard in this conference is this attempt to resist it. And you see it, you see it in Bernie's uh, vision, you see it in, the, in uh, Greg Crane's vision, I see it in the, just the structure of this conference. You have a session dedicated to pedagogy. If you go to the Digital Humanities conferences, there used to be a lot of pedagogy in it, a lot of computer-assisted language learning. It's been evacuated, it's been, Exile has been sent off to Thebes or wherever it is you send people. And, uh, uh, well, we, we sent it off to the Computer Assisted Language Learning Conferences. So that's my first. Uh, that was my first thing. Why you're exceptional? Uh, I guess the way I would summarize it is, you guys have the data set and the skills and the interdisciplinarity to test drive a lot of the integrated digital humanities that we are imagining in other disciplines. In fact, you're already doing it. Uh, and uh, and we can learn a lot from you, and, and you need to tell us about yourselves. So now I'm going to take the other di uh, uh, sort of uh, digression into my idiosyncratic hop, stop, and hop, uh, skip, jump, whatever, through uh, reading machines or philology. And I'm going to start, of course, being a philosopher with the story of the Thedress about the invention of writing. And all sorts of stuff had, can be said about this, uh, this little story. Um, one thing that a lot of people forget is that after Socrates tells the story, Phaedrus goes, oh, it's so easy to tell stories. And, and then Socrates has a, a really a non-answer to that. You know, in my mind, Phaedrus has actually put him in his place. And I've, I've never quite understood why Socrates, why Phaedrus agrees with him that, okay, I'll, I'll take it seriously. <laughs> but anyway, this story sort of ripples through time. And it's a story about the invention of technology and who gets to judge technology? One of the key points is that Thamos makes, and Thamos is this sort of philosopher king, he's, he's a lot like me, he's got a beard, he's about 50 something or other, is he, he makes this point of, you can build those cool things, but I get to judge them. And of course, this, you know, it's easy to say it like that and it sounds a little bit funny, but we in the humanities often get trapped in this paradigm that, that we are in some sense the judges of culture, we are, we, we, we have a professional role adjudicating technologies, what is good, what is bad. Uh, philosophers suffer the, from this problem a lot. So it is, it's something, that passage, that story, and reflecting on that story is, I believe, still important today. And, of course, Thomas makes the point that, you know, writing is probably not going to make anyone any wiser. In fact, I've yet to see a study that shows that any technology makes anyone any wiser. You know, I don't care how much people tell you about knowledge management and blah, 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 but have you seen a, the, have you found a study that says that people are actually made wiser by this technology or that? Um, dogs, maybe, computers, maybe, but I don't know about people. Jumping ahead, a long way, this is from this fabulous uh, uh, military engineer, Agostino Ramelli, who produced a sort of illustrated book describing all sorts of inventions that he had come up with. And one of them was this, was this, uh, this sort of multi-book. Uh, you talk about the multi-text, this is the multi-book. Uh, and, and you'll notice that the, the, you know, this gearing, uh, there, there was an artist, uh, I can't remember his name, who actually had his, his, his team build a working version of this, and I think the gearing is actually will work. The gearing allows all the books to not spill over the back. Um, as you as you slide these around, it, you know all the books stay at the same sort of angle and stuff like that. Uh, and what I find interesting about this story, of course, is how he justifies it. Because each of us, you know, when we make these arguments about what technology is going to do, how the you know scholars' workbench is going to make life better, uh, often our justification says more about ourselves and our time than anything else. And of course, he says, you know. It's in, you know, it's especially important for those who are indisposed and tormented by gout. Now, gout, I don't know about you guys, but I think gout is no longer a problem. <laughs> uh, but, you know, getting off your butt 
and going and finding the other book is a problem. You know, we're all couch potatoes at some level, so we all this sort of appeals to us. And the idea, the idea, even in the UCLA classes workbench, this idea of getting everything in one spot is this dream of, of you know frictionless research that I, I will never have to get up and walk somewhere. I'll never have to go into the stacks. I'll never have to pull down a book or be interrupted by a student or anything like that. It's just going to be straight grease lightning towards the truth. H.G. <laughs> Wells, a new type of technology. So we got from the mechanical now to the optical. H.G. Wells, and you'll see in a moment a lot of other people, were fascinated by the photo optical and what it could do. And, and he articulates this idea in an essay, you know, the idea of a permanent world encyclopedia. He articulates this idea of we can get all of human knowledge in one place, and he's of the view that that will lead to real intellectual unification of mankind. This is not unlike Greg Crane, the local dialogue. We get it all in one place, we can all access it, we can all understand each other. Something magical is going to happen. There's going to be an emergent property. Um, and you can index it. And there are actually, at the turn of the century, a number of fascinating projects. Uh, Amita wrote this essay at Circuit, but there were some really interesting projects in Europe uh, actually trying to build these uh, paper indices and, and indexing systems. And those of you who are uh, in library information science probably study those. And uh, we could learn a lot more from those. This is from, this is two years earlier, but here you can see you can see uh, a vision of how these photo-optical things, uh, Wells imagined projection rooms, but this is an imagination of how you know how you might be able to sit in your armchair. Remember, you got gout, you don't want to get up. <laughs> uh, you want to be able to adjust the focus, swing things to the proper angle, turn the leaves, and so on like that. This, by the way, is from a fabulous blog called Paleo Future. I go, all my great slides come from that blog. Uh, my great ideas too. Um, uh, jumping forward, Vannevar Bush, as we may think, father of Ivertex, father, you know, father of so many things. And what is he imagining? He's taking this idea of an encyclopedia of photo, photo optic, a photomechanical system, and he's added a couple of ingredients. One, he's added this ability to create links. And then creating links, you can create paths of information, so you can begin to exchange paths. It's not just that you have access to all this information. You can begin to inscribe yourself into it and pass those inscriptions on to people. When I get much later to a slide about nines, remind me about that because in some ways nines has picked up that idea for the scholarly association. There were some problems with this vision, like where do your knees go? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and this, this, by the way, is the system they use for capturing stuff. You can also add stuff to it. Uh, what I don't have up here, but when you read that essay, and it is a really phenomenal, seminal essay, he starts off. He starts off with the question of, you know, what are we going to do with this uh, this scientific, um, this terrific scientific uh, system or whatever you want to call it that we've developed to win the war? You know, how, what can we do in peace? Mm -hmm. So he's first, you know, imagining how to redeploy this this, uh, uh, this this amazing scientific establishment that was developed during World War II, and he was Roosevelt's science advisor. But the second thing, so then when he when he looks around for a problem, he says the problem he identifies is too much information. Now, you guys know that that problem has been around for a long time. Remember Plato? You know, too much information. You can't memorize it all. You know, we need a technology to solve the too much information problem. You know, he comes up with it. Uh, I love, uh, I mean, you know, uh, this is, you know, any time you want to start a grant, you know, you just start with, there is too much information, we need some way of dealing with it, and then, you know, that's the problem, and here's my solution, and give me the money. And uh, I guarantee you that works well, because people on evaluation panels are reading it, they have too much information. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, a little bit further forward, 1962, this is also from Paleo, uh, Paleo, Paleo uh, Future, uh, and it's uh, Our New Age was a cartoon, a sort of science and technology cartoon. It was written by Dr. Athelstan, Athelstan Spilhaus, who was dean of the University of Minnesota's Institute of Technology, and then illustrated by various different people. Apparently, this was how President Kennedy learned science uh, through, this, through this syndicated cartoon. Um, it ran for a long time. It started in 57 with, uh, with uh, Sputnik. Uh, you know, it was partly a response to Sputnik and educating Americans and so on like that. But here you can see, you can see some elements of the network system. So he's got, 
Uh, first of all, it's very, it's very much the, the new technology of the 60s. We left behind microfiche and so on like that. Now we got television and CD radio, and I'm not quite sure what I'm a mousey doing. <laughs> <laughs> that was perhaps, uh, you know, it's a sign that, that this person is also an experimental psychologist or something like that. But uh, notice this idea of distance, that we can collapse distance. And we can, researchers, uh, miles away, thousands can consult books in the Library of Congress and the British Museum. And, you know, that's something he was imagining. He didn't get the technology quite right, but we're sort of there. Which takes me to stuff that actually worked. Uh, some of the first working hypertext systems came out of Brown University. This is the third. Uh, there, was, there was Hess and then Fress. This was Intermedia. Intermedia was used by George Landau to develop the Dickens Web. Um, I couldn't find a screenshot of, of Intermedia with the Dickens Web, but the, probably you, you can. The Dickens Web is now on um, the Web Web. But it was first developed in Intermedia. Intermedia was fabulous. There are aspects of Intermedia that still haven't been implemented uh, easily on the Web. It was networked, it, uh, you know, it was a hypertext system, it was multimedia, and this is the part that was really cool, students could create their own perspectives, their own traces through the material. And in fact, that was, you know, I can remember going to talks in, in, in the early 90s, about, uh, I think it was early 90s, about how this was being used pedagogically, where students would create their own sets of links through the material, and then those would become assignments and so on and so on. And then, unfortunately, I, uh, Intermedia, Intermedia ran on, it, it needed a server running the earlier version of Apple Unix. You may remember there was a Apple AUX, Apple version of Unix that, you know, for servers and so on like that, which they then discontinued, and is completely unrelated to the OS X that we now use. But when they, when they killed AUX, then that sort of killed Intermedia. But this was, one of the first really singing and dancing was a fabulous system. And of course, uh, they were, it was developed by a scholarly technology group that was giving a lot of interesting papers and so on like that. Um, I was also working in hypertext at that time. And I can remember being on a panel and giving a paper about something I was doing in hyperguard and feeling hopelessly inadequate compared to <laughs> the stuff that they were doing. And of course now, and we heard, uh, we heard some good papers, uh, we heard an interesting challenge, I think uh, Jeff, uh, Reedberg Cox is challenging us, you know, how do we make these systems now? Because the reading machines have all of a sudden gone mobile. And, you know, just when we finally get the technology working on desktops and laptops, beep, you know, we have to re-implement it. So that's my quick little tour through, uh, through the classics. Am I allowed a little bit more time? I think I started a wee bit late. Uh, none of you want to drink quite yet. Uh, so now comes the advice section, where, where Rockwell tells you what you should do. And I'm going to start, like a good philosopher, with know yourself, right? Uh, actually, I'll put this another way. The time has come, and I'm not the only one saying this. Willard McCarty's been saying it. Uh, there's some recent stuff in DHQ. The time has come when we need to actually start paying attention to the history of computing in our disciplines. It is no longer new. It is no longer the next thing. You know, your dean may think it's new. I still meet <laughs> deans who think, oh my god, using computers in the humanities? Oh god, what an idea. Yeah, let me give you money. But you know, those are getting few and far between. And in fact, we have a rich history. You have a rich history. And often, very few of us are, are curating that history. One of the things very few of us are doing is depositing any of our projects. I gave a, a paper sort of on you know, burying your dead projects. How many of you have projects where you, which you're going to get to any day now? The grant ran out, the website is a little bit flaky, but it's sort of working, it's on a server which could disappear any day. You need to start archiving that stuff or it's going to vanish. Uh, we, we could go on and on about that. Uh, but uh, uh, I guess as a sort of word to the wise, I know the, the ACH, for example, has has petitioned the NEH and we've petitioned SHRP in Canada to start demanding a data management plan for anyone who gets a digital humanities grant. They can't just sort of say, oh, I'm gonna do something cool. And Shirk has for decades said that you have to deposit your data, but when they went looking, they found none of it deposited. You know, it's all aspirational. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll get around to it. Uh, so you're probably gonna have to start getting around to it pretty soon. Another way, so uh, this is a project I've been working on. Um, we decided to, uh, well, let it play. This is, this is the history of the interface of Perseus. 
uh, and uh, it's not entirely accurate because, of course, it's very hard to find the older versions of Perseus. We had to use the Wayback Machine. We had to make a, we were doing this without any conversation with Perseus. We have now started talking to Perseus. But it's an example of how people are getting interested in the history of interfaces and what interfaces say about stuff. I could go into, you know, why does, why does the Perseus project all of a sudden switch to the Perseus digital library? And uh, what we did is we actually developed a series of inferences and now we're actually going through them with Greg and Lisa and, and so on and, 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 you know, sort of trying to get a sense of what was that history? Have you documented it? Can we document it? Can we deposit it somewhere? Um, that, that, that video was, a, I, I must say, it was a work by one of my research assistants. It was a very smart little thing. Next thing I want to convince you of, primitives. When I, listening to the talks, especially the ones yesterday, it became clear that you guys on some areas, like places, are way ahead. But big, you know, one of the features about the semantic, you know, there was, there was a while when all of us poo pooed the semantic web and didn't think anything was going to come of it. Uh, I don't know about you, but to me, it's clear that it's working. And projects like uh, Pleiades are examples of how properly exposed data can all of a sudden be merged and mashed up with other stuff and become more than the sum of the parts. The thing is, though, that, you, that you've got places, but my understanding there's a whole bunch of uh, people projects, but none of them are standardized. You haven't quite figured out time. Uh, passages, you guys are way ahead of anyone, especially with projects like the CTS, the canonical text. I mean, you're, you're actually dealing with issues of citation and so on like that. Uh, and things you guys also are really good at. But wouldn't it be neat if you began to get all these primitives talking together so that people could begin to mash up uh, not just places, but places and texts and so on like that. And the sort of work that Matt's doing, but also to be able to use, have a large, a structured triple store that gave you some, some level of ground truth. And I put, the, I put up uh, John Unsworth, sort of, he's got a very different set of primitives, but I think these types of primitives are important architecturally. These ones are also important, and I, I should mention, by the way, he, <laughs> there's the one that he mentions, this is going for grants, um, which is probably what we spend more time doing than we, than we like to think. Um, analytics, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because we just had an absolutely fabulous uh, panel uh, about you know, once you start getting real data, what you can do with it. Though I do want to do a sort of little shout out to, I thought that redrawing the, the Orbis project, uh, uh, absolutely fabulous example of what you can start doing with, with non-textual data, how you can begin to start asking interesting questions of non-textual data. And I think the archaeological stuff we were seeing here are other examples of of gathering very rich data sets that are not textual and beginning to ask questions of them and maybe compare them to textual or drawing them from the textual and something like that. I think we have a lot to learn from you. You guys are doing analytics on these data sets that, uh, you know, we're all stuck in strings. Um, so now I'm shifting, remember, I'm sort of going through the research cycle. I'm shifting over to other ways and new ways of doing research. And I had an interesting conversation at dinner last night about, I personally think crowdsourcing. It is, I think it is very important at this moment when we've got a little bit of a sort of crisis or an austerity crisis in which uh, a lot of politicians seem to think that the larger public doesn't care about what we do. And I think they actually do. You take Ancestry.com, I mean, uh, all sorts of stuff we do is very important to people's sense of identity and culture and something like that. And we therefore need to stop this ivory tower stuff. And we have to start bringing them into the research. Now, I was told last night that you guys are, in fact, committed to elitism. That, that one, of, one of the things that people love about the classics is that when you enter it, you have this idea that there's like 900 levels. It's like World of Warcraft. There's a never-ending <laughs> of, of, of levels. And that's half the fun. So you guys don't want to do it democratically. But there's got to be ways, and the super line is a good example, there's got to be ways of stepping people in and getting people broader access. And I know Greg Crane is very committed to that. I, I'm not quite sure how it's going to work. But I, I think this is something we have to start spending time with. Another thing that we've got to start spending time with is various types of uh, research that involve modeling counterfactual arguments. Um, I was thrilled to see, I started playing around, I'd like to think that I crashed the, the, the Rome demo because that, that's me joining right at the moment when his, uh, his screen goes wacky, but he tells me the server is robust and something like that. But, <laughs> you know, that project, in some sense, gamifies uh, 
uh, gamifies in a genuine way, not the sort of not the silly sort of I'm going to give you scratch and stiff snicker, uh, stickers if you line up fastest type of gamification. It, 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 it represents knowledge. And what was even more interesting to me was building an environment in which people can make visual arguments. Now, maybe at the end of the day, when we look back at that, we'll say, yeah, these don't quite work, or it'd be better on paper anyway. But, but it's a fascinating experiment. And I think that's something that uh, we, we can learn from, and you need to do more of. Uh, on, on that note, I should say that, you know, something that I think, uh, I, I'm sure there are people doing it, but I know outside in the gamification, in the sort of serious games world, the whole business of uh, locative games that you can play in space, I think these are an obvious thing for this match of archaeology and history. I mean, how many tourists are going out there, are going to Rome because they took a classics course, wandering around Rome. You used to, in Rome, you used to be able to dial a phone number and it used to cell tower to actually figure out what building you were closer and go, hi, do you want to know about the Colosseum? Or <laughs> the, 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 the column of Trajan and press one for the Colosseum. And, you know, bing, and you'd press it and you'd hear about the Colosseum. But we can do better than that. And uh, this is a game uh, platform, a local game platform I was involved in building. This is a fabulous one that uh, is great for sort of audio tours and so like that. And it is more or less free. Uh, sharing scholarship, we're at the end of the communication. I mentioned this idea of visual arguments and, and sharing them and how impressed I was by that. Uh, but you have a series of questions, and I think other people have asked them about how classics presents itself. Uh, does it really want to be about disciplined expertise? And maybe that's actually, maybe this going to be a draw. I, I had to rethink that. Uh, is Greg Crane right that articles and books are passe and it's time to be building these digital things? I don't know, but what I do know is that we're all struggling with a question right now, in one department after another, of how do you assess the new types of scholarship? And you have, uh, uh, there's some great work done by the MLA, there's even a wiki that I, I was part of, there was a whole collection of essays and profession, if you're looking for that. Uh, it's a fascinating problem, and you, many of you have probably experienced it. How do you get your chair to take seriously this work of love that you put all these years into as scholarship when you didn't write a book? And, and you've heard the, the stories. One of the most interesting solutions to this problem is Jerome McGann's Nines. Nines, I mean, Jerome McGann got so frustrated with this. I can remember him at a conference saying, it's going to be solved one funeral at a time. You know, <laughs> old guard, and, and he's part of the old guard. The old guard has to die off, but he has to stay alive. <laughs> they freeze him. And of course, what was wrong with that is that, uh, as all of you know, the most conservative people in the academy are on tenured faculty. So it's not the old guard that got to die off. It's actually, you know, maybe this is a blessing and surprise, the fact that there are no untenured faculty for 10 years. But uh, no, that's not true. Uh, but what he did is a really cool idea, which is he basically created the scholarly association that would take digital scholarship seriously, review it, and, and validate it. So instead of trying to convince a traditional organization to validate and review uh, new forms of scholarship, uh, you know, when he found that they weren't willing to change, he changed the playing ground. He said, okay, well, here's my little playing ground over here. I'm going to create that. And I think that's something that this association DCA can be part of. You may not have to build an entirely new association because I think you actually have a long history of, of respecting digital, digital work, but it can help in creating a discourse about how to do evaluation and review well. And by well, I mean you don't write a good review for any little digital fart out there, you know. It's time that we get, that we start saying, no, that's not our particularly interesting work. You know, one more website doesn't cut it. Uh, you know, a little bit of Python code. I mean, your Python is great, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is something I could talk about until the cows come home. One of the models about where we're supposed to go is the cyber infrastructure model. And I've written a paper, are you, you know, trying to call this into question. Not saying it's wrong, but trying to say, what do we know about cyber infrastructure? What do we know about infrastructure like roads? How do they work? What happens when you invest heavily in them? And do we want that to happen? And when you think about it, uh, if we invest in cyber infrastructure, one of the things that's going to happen is that you're going to need a layer of professionals who manage it, not you. It has to be run by the right people so that there's no reinventing the wheels. Now, my read of the history of computing classics is that wheels have been reinvented over and over again, and it's a good thing. They've been reinvented because, you know, 
Computers change, paradigms change, all sorts of stuff changes. Reinventing wheels is the humanities. We are the wheel reinventors. We don't invent airplanes, we take the old wheels and we dish them up for new cars and stuff like that. But anyway, if you go the cyber infrastructure route, what you're saying is we want to hand off the job of building that, of building the library of the future to a professional class. And that can be good. It saves you all sorts of time if it's run professionally and you don't have to worry about getting another grant to do it. But it does mean some loss of control. And uh, I would argue that, in fact, we're at a period when we need to not argue for massive cyber infrastructure, but argue for infrastructure experiments. We're at a period where we don't actually know what works well enough for everybody's research that you can turn it into infrastructure, which is, then becomes transparent and so on and so on and so on. So we need the experiments. And we need to be, con we need to be open about that. And I'm going to close on day of DH. Day after tomorrow, you need to take all this cool stuff you're doing, and you need to join day of DH. And uh, day of DH, the idea of it is that for one day, Monday, one day a year, digital humanists around the world, and I, I kid you not, around the world, they start in Australia. In fact, they're probably starting now in Australia. Uh, uh, blog about what they do. You don't have to write a lot. You take a couple pictures, you write about, I, I taught this class, and I do this, and I, I went to a meeting, and something like that. And then you read everybody else's stuff while it's happening. It's a large, it's a funny form of conference where nobody has to be anywhere at, at any particular point of time. You can actually read what other people are saying, comment on it, and so on like that. So go to day DH, sign up, and make the classics really sing, you know, you know, dominate the field, which is what you deserve to do. So here are my links, and thank you very much.